we went decision making 101, 102. Sorry if you missed it. It was great. We got a video recording of it. Today we're going to be going over decision making 103. So now we're getting a little bit complex. We talked about how to limit decisions. We talked about how to quantify them. Now we're going to get into the point where actually making longer long-term decisions become profitable for you. I have some notes here. Excuse me if I, I can't like recall it from memory. Uh, but let me just pop this open. So this, uh, I guess you can say, is apply mental models, right? So there's a couple of mental models I'm going to define for you that I got from books uh, that came from like smarter people than me, right? Um, and you can find more mental models uh, for yourself by looking at people that maybe have done something that you want to do, right? So like uh, if you are a salesperson, go find someone that's in sales that has certain mental models that they do over and over again. That will get you the results, copy it, see if it works. If it doesn't work for you, move on, right? Uh, same thing for pretty much everything. 103 is going to be applying mental models. So number one, everybody knows this, very simple. When you're making a decision, you have to have a goal, right? So obvious, like I'm not trying to like uh, beat a dead horse. We talked about goals and executing on goals and how to create goals so much. So I'm going to kind of, you know, go by that one, right? So have a goal when you're making a decision so you know where you're going. Number two, kind of the same thing. We went over this a lot. Think long term. Now, when I think long term, uh, when making any decision, like, all right, for example, what's long term? Oh, God. What you, what's your quantified version of long term? What's long term for you? Oh, years. How many years? Uh, ten. It's pretty good. So usually people will say like a year or six months. So when I think long term, I think 10 to 30 years. With <laughs> every decision you make, basically. So that one's kind of easy. Most people know that. Just long term is much longer than a month, okay? Um, number three, basically... Oh, okay. Project vectors. It's a W. Project vectors and options. So when you're looking at like a decision, for example, and let's say the decision of, this is a perfect decision, the VIP group, right? VIP group. Okay. We did like one time we did the math of my half an hour and it came out to way more than we, we charged for VIP. I think VIP for my half an hour, I think we... We charge them like four hundred and thirty nine dollars, but we looked at how much we make off the of fundamental secrets, and my half an hour is worth like, like two thousand dollars or something. It was like three, three grand. It was three oh, grand for shoot. the hour. Yeah, it was three yeah. grand for the hour, but yeah. a half an hour like fifteen hundred dollars, right? Yep. So why did I do this, right? Because this is a clear violation of sacrificing the long term for the short term. I'm just getting this cash grab real quick, right? Twenty five grand, but I'm selling myself short on the half an hour. So. Basically, this, this is where this comes into play because not everything is perfect. You're not going to always be able to pick the long-term decision every single time. Like, like my long-term goal was to make a software company. I couldn't just scale up directly to a software company because I had no money to pay anybody. Right? How could I do that when I have no marketing, I have no team, I can't pay developers? How am I going to start a software company and go straight to the long-term? I had to sacrifice a little bit of the long-term for short-term. So what I mean by vectors is like, this is you. This is your goal. So there's obviously the straight path. Maybe um, someone's a genius and they can Mark Zuckerberg by themselves. I can't, I, and I, I'm, I'm humble enough to say that. Uh, but there's also things like this. And there's also things like this, right? So the path I kind of took was like something like this with the business. I created something else that generated cash flow. Uh, the cash flow had directly to do with um, you know, the actual software I'm going to develop in the future. Um, and then recently, you know, when uh, Alex Moy killed the deal, we just went, boom, boom. Okay. So basically quantify all your decisions and options. So when you're making a long-term decision, whatever the case is, it's not always a straight line. Sometimes you have to sacrifice a little bit to get to where you want. And if you write out all the options, you know, short-term, long-term, medium-term, a combination of both, and you just list them out, it's going to give you higher quality decisions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody got that? Sure, yeah. Any questions sure. on this? This is like a higher quality concept. Okay. Now, number four, half-life of decisions. So we kind of talked about this a little bit in the last one. So it's a refresher for people that didn't see it. Basically, every decision you make has a time frame in which it's like, okay, so when you make a decision, you have to spend like 10 minutes, right? Thinking about it, right? How long do you have, uh, does it take for that decision to you have to make it again? Does that make sense? So like you want to pick decisions that don't have a short half life. For example, uh, we always talk about this example. Should I go eat takeout? I spent 10 minutes thinking about what I'm going to eat. 
five minutes to call them, another 10 minutes to drive there, and another tw 20 minutes to eat it. Versus getting a meal plan that takes me 15 minutes to sign up for, but I get meals for a month. The meal plan has a half-life of a month. This has a half-life of six hours because you get hungry in six hours. Does that make sense? Pick longer term half-life decisions. Like always go as long as you possibly can. This is just another way of explaining it. Same thing with the clothes. I wear black tee and shorts every single day. Every, and then Saturday comes and I might dress up, right? So my half-life is like five, six days when it comes to clothing, right? You can even say longer because I do the same thing again on Monday. But just like essentially, just think about like what's the half-life of your decision and try to make it and push it as far and long as you possibly can. And then you'll make less decisions, which will allow you to make better decisions because you're not using up your dis decision fatigue, right? We talked about decision fatigue before. All right. Number five, we talked about second order consequences. For example, you want to buy a TV, that's 1K. Uh, yeah. Most people look at the TV as just one decision. Is it 1K going to be in my bank account or the 1K is going to be in a TV? That's what you call an amateur decision maker. A person that actually knows how to make good decision is going to look at it from second, third, fourth, fifth order consequences. There's levels to this. If I could literally spin around in this room, point to one random object, and talk about 17,000 different variables in that one object. Life is much deeper than you think. So when you make one decision, there's a lot of consequences that come with it. You pay $1,000 for the TV, now you have to spend maybe an hour a day watching it, right? Then your posture gets messed up, then, and you gotta do yoga, then you have to buy an entertainment system or speakers, then, I don't know, you have to upgrade your TV in like five years. So there's like so many more consequences of buying a TV than just the initial price, if that makes sense. So when you're thinking about a decision, think about the second, third, fourth, fifth, as long as you possibly can, consequences that will come from your decision and it'll allow you to make better decisions in the future. Things are All right, number six. I'm not gonna write it out because it's gonna take too long. To, and we'll do six and seven together. It's dependencies and sequences and weighing the input and output symmetry of your decision. So dependencies and sequences, what does that mean? So I made a business that's primarily, it started off as me marketing my YouTube to cryptocurrency, right? But what did that turn into? It turned into kind of like another sequence, which was a digital course. And then what did that turn into? Now potentially a software. So the digital course has like four different, that we can do the small, medium, and large digital, digital courses. But essentially, it's hard to explain, it's mostly business. But when you're making a decision, try to look for things that are you can make parallel decisions. So like when you make one, I can't relate, I can only relate to business. I made this one decision to go into crypto. We made a course on the crypto. We, we learned a lot about how to build companies. Now I can make a second order decision to now create the actual company rather than researching them because, but it's directly in line. Does that make sense? Kind of like piggybacking off that first decision. Does that make sense? Right. So try to find parallels within your first decision, whatever it is. Like try to quantify it so many different ways. Like for example, all natural upgrades. That was kind of like a second order decision because you're already in the fitness industry. You don't have to do too much. You can just add the supplement onto your brand and you'll make more money and you didn't really have to do anything. That's like a second order decision. Make one right? decision that solves for everything, right? Make a decision that can turn into better decisions in the future. That's long story short. I mean, you can talk about this for hours, but we're not, we're running out of time here. Sequences as well. Um, it kind of plays into the half-life, but you're going to get basically certain decisions that will go linear. We talk about this all the time, right? We talk about this at the company all the time. And the reason why I invest all the money back in the company. You can get decisions that go parabolic, and then you can get decisions that have decay. Always, obviously, try to go at least linear, but you're going to get a select few times where you get this parabolic decision. You're never going to get like maybe two or three in your lifetime where you can make a parabolic decision. Like one parabolic decision for me was cryptocurrency. It paid off dividends exponentially. It paid off a lot. But ma vast majority of them are gonna be like this, but avoid these, at least avoid these. And then you can bring them. This is another way of saying the same thing we just said here. Make decisions that last longer and don't decay over time, right? And then the last one, we'll end it here. Weighing the input versus output. So when you make a decision, there's a certain amount of energy you gotta put in to make that decision happen. So there's, there's energy you use to make the decision and there's actual physical energy to execute the decision, right? So make sure, for example, if this is the line, let's say you put one unit of effort, make sure you get 10 units of results. And then you can go vice versa. If you put 10 units of effort to make this decision, make sure you're not getting one unit of results. So whatever you do, like if you're taking two hours to decide how much, you know, what clothes you're gonna wear to go out, right? And you get one compliment, 
You just wasted two hours for one compliment. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I'm just relating it to what I already know, but you're going to see this come up like a lot. Like for example, the chip, the table, that's like a good example. Like you, like you want to refurbish this table. I'm like, look, I could spend 20 extra dollars, get a brand new one. And you don't have to spend three hours refurbishing a table. Right. That was an example of me saying, look, I'm just going to put up the money, put one unit of effort and get a little bit quicker time so we can make these videos and make much more money because the videos make us a lot of money. And if I can get that up and running fast, it's much better for me to put up just more cash. You know what I mean? But but then the table was a good example of the opposite. So the table is five grand, but she made one in a, in a couple of days for 200 bucks. That's a perfect example of making the right decision where you put in a effort, but a lot comes out of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you save the business money in that case, but the table is like, who cares? You know, just buy a new one. Any questions about any of this? All right, so we got new person here. <laughs> Developer, we're creating the coin. Welcome. Welcome. Um, yeah, if you want to explain a little bit about yourself or whatever the case is. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> On the spot. So my name is Sebastian. I'm graduating from UCF uh, at the end of this month uh, in computer science. I know very little about cryptocurrency, but I'm very eager to learn more. And yeah, I thank you, Alex, for the opportunity, and I hope to you know, bring this company forward more. Yeah, let's okay. go. I told everybody, oh. you're gonna go.